Welcome to the Becoming Superhuman Podcast, where we interview extraordinary people to bring you the skills and strategies to overcome the impossible. And now, here's your host, Jonathan Levy. Before we get started, I just want to let you guys know that this week's episode is brought to you by my new online course, Become a Superhuman. And yes, it sounds exactly like the title of the podcast, but this is actually an online course where we go into the various aspects of improving your health, specifically your endocrine health. More specifically, yes, more specifically, getting your testosterone up to the optimal levels. Now, whether you're a male or a female, as we've learned in numerous episodes of the show, testosterone is the ultimate feel-good motivation, improved health, improved fitness, improved body composition, super drug, okay? So everything from your mood to your recovery time and everything in between is affected by your body's endocrine health. And what my team and I have done is we've actually taken years of my own self-experimentation, years of research, every possible literature and study we could find, and we've condensed it into a simple three to four hour program that you can follow along and make simple, safe, and easy adjustments to your lifestyle to improve your endocrine health. Now, as listeners of this podcast, you can get a very special discount by visiting jle.vi slash T. That's jle.vi, just like my name, slash T for testosterone. This episode is brought to you by Organifi. You guys, one of the only things that every nutritional expert that we've had on the show seems to actually agree on is that we all need to eat more vegetables, eat more greens, eat organic, cut out all the processed junk. Well, who has the time, right? Who has the time to go out, do the shopping, make the salads, make the juices, make the smoothies? And that's what I love so much about Organifi. Their product is an all organic green juice. It has all of the nutrients that you need. It tastes absolutely amazing. And it's made by wonderful people who I consider to be personal friends. And as listeners of this show, you guys can actually save 20% on your first order. And all you have to do is go to Organifi.com. That's O-R-G-A-N-I-F-I.com and use the coupon code SUPERHUMAN at checkout. Greetings, super friends, and welcome to this week's episode, you guys. Today, we are joined by Dr. Sherrod Paul, who is many, 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 many things. He's a skin cancer surgeon, family physician, an academic, a skincare expert, an evolutionary biologist, a storyteller, and a social entrepreneur, as well as an adjunct professor at Auckland University of Technology. He was originally born in England with a childhood in India. He's a global citizen who now lives in New Zealand, and in 2008, he was featured in in international editions of Time. He's also been awarded the prestigious Ko Awatea International Excellence Award for leading health improvement on the global scale. I also discovered that he was an advisor to UNESCO, that he has written books in the fiction and nonfiction, scientific and non-scientific spheres, and has a skincare line, among many, many other ventures. In the episode, we talk about so many things. We talk about genetics and his interest in how we can alter our genetics and genetic expression, how we can optimize our health through understanding our own individualized genetics. And then we go into a deep discussion of vitamin D and skin cancer, sunscreen, and all the different things that Frankly, I didn't know, and I'm pretty sure you didn't know about how the whole piece fits together. So it's a really incredible episode. I know you guys are going to enjoy it. I certainly enjoyed the conversation very much. So without any further ado, let me present to you guys my new super friend, Dr. Sherrod Paul. Dr. Sherrod Paul, welcome to the show, my friend. How are you doing today? Very good. Thank you. My pleasure. Awesome. So today, as I understand it, we are here to talk a little bit about genetics and, well, a lot of topics that we haven't covered in too, too much depth, including genetics, including skin health. But first, I wanted to understand, I mean, you have this diverse medical background as a geneticist, as an expert in skin health. I believe you're also a surgeon. So I wanted to ask a little bit about your career trajectory and how you kind of came to be where you are today. All right. 
I guess fundamentally, I think of myself as a creative, and I think that's uh, really what's brought me where I am. So in my main job, I'm a skin cancer surgeon, and really the genetic element of it came from the fact that when we deal with advanced cancers, we normally test somebody's genes to see if they're going to respond to a particular medication. So from there came the Genetics of Health book because we were looking at genes when it came for illness. And I was thinking, why do we only do this for illness and not wellness? And what about genes for, say, coffee and exercise and stress and everything else? And hence uh, came out this book, The Genetics of Health, which was really an extension of the genetics of skin. But really, one thing we must understand is skin is our only universal organ. So there are many creatures like starfish, for example, which don't have hearts, and there are sea squirts, which don't have brains, but everyone's got skin. So skin is our largest organ, and it's also a sense organ. So it's the first thing to respond to our environments. So in some ways, it's a very special organ. But to answer your question again as to how did I actually end up here, as with a lot of things, it was accident and design because I was born in England and my parents went back to India to do a medical mission work. And then I ended up moving down under to New Zealand. But when I moved here, you know, New Zealand, unlike the U.S., wasn't, you know, used to a lot of immigrants coming in. So you've actually found it very difficult to find a career path and what you really wanted to do. And at that stage, my training was plastic surgery to do with burns and trauma. But when I came to New Zealand, most of the people in plastic surgery were more interested in cosmetic and you really needed to be that way inclined, which is, of course, better for business. But I was more interested in reconstructive surgery. And down under in Australia and New Zealand, we have the world's highest rate of skin cancer because of the high UV So I sort of ended up becoming an expert in this area and then ended up writing books and educating people. And then next it led on to a role on UNESCO because I teach creative writing to children who can't read and write properly. And I note that you have a great interest in accelerated learning. So I guess we have something in common there. Absolutely. Absolutely. So very interesting. So I want to dig in kind of right out of the gate into the book. As you said, it's titled The Genetics of Health, Understand Your Genes for Better Health. And I'm really interested in this for a couple of different reasons. One, because I think it's a very emerging area right now, you know, to map our individual genome, to understand our genes. But I also think that it's right kind of at the cusp. You know, I've personally done, as many people in the audience probably have done, this whole 23andMe genetic testing and kind of found it like, okay, now what? So I wanted to ask you, you know, how can we understand our genes a little bit better? And then what kind of things can that influence in our lives? Because, you know, for me, one of the only things I took away from 23andMe was, okay, I metabolize caffeine faster than the average person. And everything else was like, yeah, you know, I know my family came from this area of Europe and I know. So tell me a little bit about that and what kind of things we can understand. All right. So broadly speaking, I think the first thing we need to understand is the genes, our genetic profile is our blueprint, but it isn't our destiny, right? So that's something I like saying, because really we are in control, even though you may have a fundamental blueprint, it doesn't mean that's how you're going to end up. Because everything in life, every disease, everything for both good and bad is a combination of our environment and our genes. So I guess uh, to explain, there are three different types of gene testing around the world at the moment. And the most common one is like what you said is what we call WGS or the whole genome sequencing. And that's what you've had done to 23andMe. The problem I have with that model is sometimes there's a little bit of information overload because you test for a lot of things, diseases which you can't do anything about. And I think the stress response is such a big part of it that it can have implications. The second type of testing is people do the microbiota, and that is to do with how you may have an intolerance to a certain food, and that's done from feces and things. And even that's not very accurate. So what I've done is we've basically developed a panel which we just specifically identify a single nucleotide polymorphism or a little variants in a gene which implicates something. In your case, you know, even caffeine one is an SNP, but we identify 21 different ones and they're fundamentally to do with diet and exercise. 
So it's really all about what you can do to optimize your performance, be it in learning or executive function or exercise. So for example, we can pick people who have more power genes versus endurance genes. So I guess, you know, if you're planning your training regime, or I've been asked to work with some junior youth squads because, you know, sometimes you don't know when everyone's the same size, who's going to be faster and who's going to be more powerful and things like that. And it helps the coaches plan their positions and things like that. So I guess in, in some ways, I'm just taking this and applying it to, it's almost like applied genetics for daily living as opposed to mm-hmm. finding out your ancestry or finding out what disease you're going to get. Fascinating. Okay. So I was hoping that was going to be the answer because I want to ask for some kind of examples and and understand. I mean, I think the endurance versus raw power strength is a really, really good one. What other types of things can people understand about themselves that actually our whole motto with the show is kind of practical techniques and skills and strategies that can help you in your day-to-day life overcome things that you feel are impossible? So what kind of things could I learn about myself that would actually impact my behavior, maybe the way that I eat, the way that I train, the way that I live, the way that I manage different aspects of my life? All right. So for example, let's just look at we discuss exercise and then the other things like, you know, stress and, you know, how we manage our anxiety or pain tolerance. So now there's an interesting thing because, you know, stress and anxiety and also even procrastination have an evolutionary trait. So if you stop and think about it, modern human beings only came out of Africa 100,000 years ago. And when we came out of Africa, life was very dangerous. So, you know, even with all this terrorism and everything else, we live in the safest of times now. So I pointed those in the book because while writing the book, I thought, let's take a time, you know, Shakespeare's stories are full of violence and gore and everything else and murders and everything. So I thought, let me look at what was the murder rate at that time. And in Oxford, it was one in... 350. And I think in London, it was one in 500 people died by homicide. Now it's something like, I think, five for 2.8 million or something like that. So the point is, we actually do live in the safest of times, even if we don't think so. And why don't we think so? And partly it's because at that time, as you would know, fitness, the word means different things in biology and in public dictionary. So for example, if you asked a lay person, what's fitness, they'll say physical fitness. They think fitter, stronger, faster. But if you ask a biologist, fitness, when we say survival or the fittest is fitness is the ability to propagate your genes. So if you think about a time when predators were all over and human footprint was very small, and there were saber two tigers roaming around, the scary cats survived because many of them didn't fight the real battles. So if you're still in the cave thinking, I'm not going to fight, the tiger is going to get me, you will actually survive. Doesn't mean you were more powerful, but it meant because your fear prevented you from getting killed. Likewise, if you were a procrastinator, you were kept saying, you know, my spear is not sharp enough. And you kept, and these were an evolutionary adaptation which helped you propagate your genes because the real brave genes died out. <laughs> so in some ways... You see what I mean? So we carry these genes with us, but we use it inappropriately. So sometimes you're having an argument with your boss or a spouse or whatever, you get the same stress response. But, you know, we've got to just chill and think, hang on for a minute. No one's going to eat us. No one's a saber to a tiger. You know what I mean? But we actually use that response inappropriately. But if you know how to channel it, in short bursts, it's actually very good. That's why a lot of this adrenaline sports in short bursts are good. But if you are stressed over a long period of time, then you have cortisol, other hormones secreted which suppress your immune system and they can lead to illness and more and more problems, you know, weight gain and various things. So I think to a large degree, knowing your personality. So let's just say you were somebody you knew you didn't handle stress very well, then it's very important for you to learn things like meditation and things like that, which help you to switch off a bit and, you know, calm down. Or if you're a procrastinator, you know, you can learn some other methods of motivating yourself, doing some things creatively, various things. So, you know, you can use all this to your advantage. Fascinating. And so I guess my big surprising takeaway is that our something like our stress response is actually coded into our genetics. And it's something that we can observe and say, hey, you have the genetics of someone who is not going to perform well under pressure. Absolutely. And also... To some degree, 
But one thing we must also understand is genes fundamentally look out for themselves. They're not there for us. So like Richard Dawkins wrote about what he called the selfish gene. And the main reason is genes just make proteins and your actions may make them make bad proteins and good proteins. So it's some ways up to you. So for example, there's a gene called AVPR1, which we know is the gene for generosity. But what's interesting with it is the same gene. So people who were more generous actually had better health. But what was interesting is if people who didn't have the gene started giving more, what actually happened is they ended up producing all those chemicals which express the gene to then, you know, become active. So, for example, let's look at another sluggish gene. That's another chapter in the book, like we said, laziness. So what happens is there is actually a lazy gene, which means that you are a couch potato and you don't get motivated to exercise. But when they had mice, for example, who had this gene, but they put them on a treadmill and give them endurance training, after some time, they started expressing proteins, which made them enjoy it. And then they wanted to do more and more and they become this mm -hmm. energetic. So it is about, you know, bursting through the barrier. And after that, you're OK, just like you're learning. You know what I mean? Everybody thinks you can't speed learn, you can't be creative, you can't do this. But you've taught people. So you know that it's about once they get through the initial, you know, the hesitation after that, you're away. Precisely. I think that's actually been one of my biggest takeaways, macro takeaways from hosting the podcast is understanding, as you said, I really like it and you articulated it in a new way I haven't heard, which is your genes aren't your fate. And I think, you know, Dr. Lauren Cordain talks about it and Rob Wolf talks about it, that the food you eat is an instruction, which will, you know, there's kind of a, a branch tree in the code of your genetics that says, if we're doing well and our inflammation is low, do this. And if our inflammation is high, do this and that you can choose which kind of branch of the code you fork into. And therefore you can have genetics of two people, you know, twins who are so very different because of the way the genes are expressed. Absolutely. And that's right. Because in everything else, if you look, see, typically like, for example, if you take diet, for example, let's look at say vitamin C, for example, it's a very interesting gene. And there is a GSTT1. I find it very interesting on two counts because on one hand, it's an evolutionary use it or lose it thing. So they're creatures like gorillas and humans and bats, which eat a lot of citrus fruit. So we don't actually produce vitamin C in our body. So we have to ingest it. Whereas other creatures which don't eat these, like, you know, sheep and other creatures, they actually produce their own vitamin D so they can actually repair their own wounds and things because they produce vitamin C. But what it means is, let's look at in human beings, one in five people, so about 20% of the population carries a non-functioning variant of the GSTD1, what we call a deletion variant. And what it means is, if these people do not double their intake or triple their intake of vitamin C every day, and this is just by eating natural, then each year your blood sugar went up by 0.1% your waist circumference went up by 0.2 inches. So it was really interesting because they gained weight, their sugar went up, their blood pressure went up. So these guys, by the time, and this was a study done in Canadians who were like 20s and 30s, and then they repeated it in Asia. And what they found is by the time these people were 40s and 50s, they had either borderline diabetes or diabetes or heart disease or kidney disease or blood pressure. But typically medicine only picks them up at that point. So the point I was making is if you knew this gene, all you needed to do is eat an extra orange a day, for example, and it literally keeps the doctor away. So sometimes, you know, we can use this and it's not about, you know, selling anything because as you know, most supplements will get excreted if they're not in its natural form. So in some ways, if you knew you had this gene, it's a massive thing because that means that you may be trying everything else, but you just simply may not be losing weight. And you may be thinking, you know, try to done all this because it may be as simple as you not knowing that you've got this variant of a vitamin C gene. So I think, you know, there are a few genes like that, which are very significant. You know, the folate one, there are a few things which you, the folate ones tested in the panel you've done. But, you know, this type of thing is very interesting. Definitely. So I wanted to ask on the note of the panel that I did. You know, I assume in your book, one of the first kind of recommendations is go ahead and get your genetics tested so that you can then go through the examples and teachings in the book. Is there a specific 
genetic testing that you advocate or how does that whole thing work? Yeah, so actually I've done it in reverse. So what I say is you first read the book because there are a lot of general themes we can take away and then doing the genetic test is really then fine tuning it for yourself as an individual because the report I give you is very personalized saying, you know, you can have so many milligrams, this, da, da, da. So it just gives you a good overall picture. So, you know, we've got to live life and have fun, but you just knowing this just sort of helps. So at the back of the book, or if you just went to my website, you know, sharadpaul.com, or you just did geneticsofhealth.com, you can actually order the test or the book. So it's basically linked to the book. But if you read the book, it actually also gives you some general themes like what types of movement help brain function and learning and um, we can talk about that. Those are also very interesting, which we don't test for, but in, there are a lot of general themes you can take away as to what you can do to actually propagate useful genes in your various. The test pretty much focuses on practical steps as to how do I tailor my exercise to my gene profile? How do I eat for it? And it's all about optimizing performance, being more positive and being proactive. I like that. I want to ask one more question because I know that there's someone out there in the audience who's going to use this information and take it and say, well, everyone has different genes and my genes just say, for example, you know, no matter what I eat, I'm going to be overweight or this kind of defeatist attitude. No matter what I eat, I'm not going to be able to, you know, be a strong weightlifter or, you know, all these kinds of excuses where people say, but, you know, my genetics just does best with eating ice cream every day. It's, you know, is there that much variance? Or is it the case that pretty much the good advice that we hear from so many people, you know, don't eat a lot of sugar, exercise three to five times a week, stuff like that. I mean, is it to the extent of variance that some people have this excuse that they're going to be overweight no matter what? Or is it the case that look, the variance is 10 to 20% of, you know, which exercise you do? And do you eat sweet potatoes? Or do you eat pumpkins, you know, or squash, as opposed to eating, you know, something like, I guess the question is, how much leeway is there in this? And and how much can people actually use genetics as an excuse for poor health? I think very little, because I think everything in life, be it health, wellness, everything is combination of genes and environment. So for example, if you take cancers, as an example, if you took lung cancer, for example, smoking is the environment, and then some people have the genes, so therefore you may not be a smoker and you may develop it if you're unlucky. If you take skin cancer, in which I work, UV radiation is the environment, and some people have the bad genes for it, and then you may have the combination of the two. So I guess to answer your question, yes, it's almost impossible for anybody to just be genetically programmed that they're going to gain weight no matter what. But if you knew they had these genes, like I said, if if they had this vitamin C gene, yes, they may be trying everything else and it may not work, but we may be able to give them tips. So you're right. I don't think genes doom you that you can't really get out of the cycle. But having said that, it's often the attitude or the way people take with respect to genetics or thinking, oh my God, my, everybody in my family is like that. So I'm actually doomed to develop the problem. The one thing you need to also think about is, but within the gene test we do, there's certain things, if we're specifically talking about weight gain, because you mentioned it. So there's another gene, a protein gene, FTO, which is a, like an obesity gene, Some people have it, which means these are the folks who can eat a high protein diet and lose weight. Whereas for other people, it may not be good. It may even be harmful. So that's why when you see books like, you know, the Atkins or whatever, and people say paleo or things like that, it's really some people are more suited for certain kinds of diets just because it, but sometimes there's certain diets which may be harmful for you, which is very rare, but it's typically if you have got say gluten intolerance in its most severe form, you can be at the celiac end where it becomes an autoimmune disease where your immune system is reacting to it. At the mild extreme, it's almost like just having a minor allergy, in which case you're just getting a bit of indigestion, but your immune system is not stimulated. So in some ways, if you had a specific problem like that, then doing the gene test is helpful. But like you said, overall, if you ate things in moderation, you cut out sugar, you exercise regularly, you moved for movement's sake, the movement is so important, and you were giving person, you were more positive, 
these things generally lead to good health. But within it, if there is an area you're finding, I'm not handling stress well, I know I'm struggling to enjoy any form of exercise, I can't just lose weight. If you end up hitting a brick wall, then maybe a gene test like the one we've developed helps you fine tune it. Mm -hmm. I like that. And my takeaway from that is kind of coming full circle on how we got into this topic. You know, your genetics would not allow you to not have good health, because if that were the case, you wouldn't have made it this far down the evolutionary <laughs> That's timeline. Right. So there is a way, it's just a matter that, you know, it may be some minor little deviation off of, I think this ties in nicely to kind of Rob Wolf's second book, Wired to Eat, I don't know if you've read it, but where he talks about, look, okay, this paleo template is a good one as a starting point, but it's not a one size fits all. And some people may do better with brown rice as opposed to sweet potatoes. And some people may be able to get away with eating, you know, kidney beans and not have inflammation. But it, it does seem to be the case that good health advice is good health advice. Move, don't eat processed foods. That's pretty much the case for everybody. That's right. Because, you know, the other way is you must also look at what we're putting into our bodies as our internal environment. So that's still environmental in a way, and that still affects our genes. So the other way of looking at it is if somebody ate a lot of processed food and you ate. So in fact, there were studies done where mice and then people were put on what they call quote unquote American cafeteria diet, which was basically Coke and fast food. And what they found is that you started to express not only the laziness genes, but you expressed obesity genes, but you also expressed stress and anxiety genes, which made you more angry and stressed and things like that. So in some ways, if you're eating a lot of those kind of foods, you're more likely to be angry and stressed and putting on weight and therefore also becoming less energetic. So in some ways, you are also what you eat. So if you eat too much processed food, then effectively you become a processed person. So your <laughs> thought process and everything else also gets processed because then you start thinking in a certain way because you think this is me, this is how I am. But it's really because you're creating that environment, which is creating a new you. Certainly. And that's been another one of my huge takeaways is that everything is all connected. You know, if, if your diet goes to shit, then you don't have the motivation to exercise. If you don't exercise, you don't sleep well. If you don't sleep well, your attitude, be and it just becomes this either downward Absolutely. or that's upward right. spiral. And if one piece falls out, you know, you're exercising, Every single day, you're waking up at 5 a.m. to run and you're eating really, really well. But then as a product of that, you're not sleeping, then it still all starts to fall apart. That's right. Absolutely. And that's why I think, you know, having a bit of balance is important. So, you know, all these things, like I said, they're blueprint, but, you know, you've got your own destiny in your own hands. Absolutely. And I really, really like that because it can be overwhelming, but it can also be very empowering for people to realize, you know, I, I don't have this fate handed to me. I haven't been dealt a bad card because, you know, my parents came from this part of Europe and people there always have this specific, you know, stomach problem. And so I think I would encourage people to take that as an empowering thing, not as an overwhelming responsibility thing. And that's right. And that's one of the reasons why in our panel, we actually don't test for any illness at all. So we don't want to know whether you've got a high risk of Alzheimer's or this or that, because we don't really care. Because I think then you get more anxious about it. You get focused on illness, anxiety and stress has in itself a lot of bad health effects. So I think then it becomes a vicious cycle again. So the best is just know what you need to know, which you can make changes. So we only do the ones which are actionable things which you can make some changes to achieve better outcomes. So I don't worry about telling you what you have. And the other, other thing I'm concerned about, like when I was in the US and I was meeting a lot of other guys doing these kind of tests, is, you know, the insurers were very much involved in a lot of these things. In our kind of tests, the ones I do are all for wellness, so there are no implications. But um, I do have concerns in this day and age where we're increasingly monitored and everything else. I do have concerns that these kind of whole genome tests are a bit of a worry because you never know down the track someone's going to say, hang on, you can't get any insurance because this gene test showed that you're going to get Alzheimer's or something. You know what I mean? So mm -hmm. I think it's just better to not worry about illness, but just focus on wellness. And then automatically you have less illness and it's also less expensive. 
Definitely, definitely. And, and at least for the things that you can't control. I mean, for things that That's you can't right. control, I would love to know if eating this specific food is going to give me diabetes like it gave my uncle. But yeah, if I can't control it, it might just be better not to know. That's right. So speaking of disease, I want to ask you because I just had a conversation earlier this week with a friend about skin cancer. And I think there's a lot, we've done a really, really good job, society that is, has done a really good job educating people to use sunscreen. But now we've done such a good job that I understand that most people are vitamin D deficient. So what I've always struggled, and we've never had a skin cancer expert on the show, we've had some skin experts, but never skin care and skin cancer. I want to understand a generic guideline, and I understand that this is going to have to be, you know, if you are from an African population and you have very dark skin, it's going to be very different than if you're from a Northern European population. But what's a kind of guideline for us? Because I understand we need sun and putting sunscreen on for the five minute walk from the parking garage to the office is probably not a good thing. Whereas baking in the sun. So there's some finite kind of guideline in the middle there for how people should go about exposing themselves to the right amount of sun. And I'm wondering if you have any thoughts on that. All right. So firstly, you'd have to understand why we all have different skin colors. And I'm just going to touch on it briefly because that explains then follows on as to our sunscreen use and how we manage our skin cancer risk. So firstly, to answer your question, to get enough vitamin D exposure out of the sun, you need a minimum of 20 minutes a day and 20% body surface area ballpark, right? So if you just got only your head exposed, so 20% roughly is like t-shirt and shorts kind of stuff. And then at least 20 minutes in uh, short bursts during the day, because after that time, your vitamin D absorption by the skin gets saturated anyway, so you're not going to absorb anymore, right? And if you bake yourself all day after a while, the UVA rays tend to denature some of the vitamin D so you don't get it anyway. So that's a separate thing. So let's just step back and look, why are we all vitamin D deficient to some degree? And this is something you'd find very interesting because of your neuroscience thing. And this is why I was saying, you know, that you cannot differentiate skin and brain to a large degree because for many primitive creatures, the skin is their fundamental sense organ. So I, one of the other things I do other than reconstruct human faces is I'm often ask to operate on animals. So I've operated on, you know, many apes and lemurs and orangutans and all this sort of stuff. And always joke about the fact that, you know, when you're operating on an animal, you literally have 50 people wanting to assist you. But if you're trying to, I'm a real softie and I'm trying to come in on a weekend and do an old lady's tumor on the eye, you can't find anyone else willing to come in and help you. But the funny thing in operating with apes, what I found is if you shave the skin, the hair, the skin was slightly lighter than what I expected. So the reason for that is, see, the brain is just a computer. And as you know, all computers need cooling systems. So as we evolved into human beings, we lost fur because we needed to cool down our body so that our computer, our brain could function more effectively. And that's why we retained hair on our head, as opposed to not all over the body with the same thickness. But on the other hand, this happened over 28 million years because the first apes appeared 28 million years ago, and the first humans were only really 100 to 200,000 years ago. So this happened so gradually that Africans actually developed high pre-vitamin D levels, which automatically makes them better athletes because vitamin D increases, or pre-vitamin D increases your muscle strength, injury recovery time is reduced, bone strength. So that's why, uh, you know, African descent people are generally better athletes. But when people migrated into Europe, there was not enough sunlight. So people's skin needed to lighten to absorb more vitamin D. So what happened is, but when you absorb more vitamin D, there's a constant battle between folic acid and vitamin D. And the reason our skin's darkened in the first place was to preserve folic acid, because if you don't have folic acid, you have higher birth defects. And that's why when women think of becoming pregnant, the doctors give them folic acid. So what it automatically means is I've actually given a TED talk on it, and it's called the myth of race. And if you see the full talk, you'll see what I mean. You can predict Olympic medals. You can predict populations. It's not an accident that Asia and Africa have larger populations. It's largely because if you're darker skinned, you have more folic acid because less folic acid is destroyed by sun. And therefore, you actually have lower birth defects. But in Asia, there's a reason why 
generally you're not as good athletes and that's all in the TED talk. But to come back to your question, if, so if your lighter skin like of Celtic skin descent and you move to a place like Australia, New Zealand, which many people did, we have a very high rate of skin cancer fundamentally because that skin type did not evolve to live here. So for example, we do actually have a rating for skin type. So for example, if you looked at type one skin, which is uh, typically a redhead and type two is blonde and blue eyes. So if you're blonde and blue eyed, 100 minutes divided by the UV index of the day gives you your burn time. So for example, the UV index is normally reported in your weather report. So if you looked at the UV index, let's just say oh, today was 10, it was summer, and you were blonde, that means in a place where the UV index was 10, it will be 100 divided by 10, which was 10 minutes would be your burn time. So if you were going to be in the sun for 150 minutes, then you would need SPF, you know, 10 multiplied by 15. So you would need an SPF 15. So the myth is that SPF 30 is twice as powerful as 15. It isn't. An SPF 15 lets in one in 15 harmful rays, which means it gives you 93% protection. An SPF 50 lets in one in 50, which means it gives you 98%. And an SPF 30 is 97%. So there's actually very little difference between the three. But what you need to know and tailor it is how much time are you going to actually spend out in the sun? So like you said, if you're just going to be out for five minutes between the cut, it's probably a complete waste of time and an overkill. You may as well get that little vitamin D you're going to get because you're not going to burn in that time and cause any damage anyway. But if you're going to be out all day playing sport, then you can actually calculate the time calculate the UV index and for your skin type. So my previous book before the genetics of health is actually called Skin A Biography and it's a story of skin. And there's actually a chart in the book where each of us can calculate our own SPF and sun exposure based on different climatic conditions. Wow, that's actually incredible. I had no idea that it was such a scientific thing that those numbers were directly attributable. I mean, this is kind of like the moment when I realized the interrelations in the metric system, you know, that one kilo of water took up one square, so on and so forth. <laughs> and that one kilo was one liter. I'm like, wait a minute, it goes between the volume and the distance and then this and that. <laughs> it's like huge moment. So I didn't realize that SPF was correlated also to skin types and time of exposures and that it was all kind of a base 10, 100 minutes system. Absolutely, for different skin types. So for example, if it is funny, but you know, you're not the one, like I teach skin doctors every day. I only teach postgrads, but I tell you something, when I start my course, uh, and this chapter in that skin biography is part of uh, learning for the master's in skin cancer program at the University of Queensland. And what I find interesting is all these guys are already doctors and are already adv advising people on skin and everything else. And no one's heard of this. But it's really right. interesting. The science has been there and it's actually been developed. So, for example, if you said you were a ginger redhead, then you would be 67 minutes divided by the UV index. If you're blonde and blue eyes, it would be 100. And if you're type 4 skin, which would be like, you know, a Spanish or lighter Indian skin, something like that, that would be 300 divided by the UV index. So actually, the Times of London, I think maybe a week last week or the week before, they did a big article on sunscreen there quoted me extensively and they put my chart in there as well. So you'll find it as well. So there is this precise science there and you can actually use it. So I say to people, so for example, if someone's all day playing a sport like, you know, cricket or something, then what I would say to them is, listen, sunscreen is more effective if it's reapplied after a few hours. So you basically calculate if you're going to be out for six hours and you've got a break after three hours, then all you need is choose the SPF you need for those three hours. So it's going to be more effective when you come back and you reapply. So there's no point putting in too much chemicals on your body that you don't need as well. Mm -hmm. So you can just tailor it to what you need. So you just step back and look at it scientifically and think, okay, this is my skin type. I'm going to spend so much time in the sun. Why lather yourself with more chemical than you need? Right. But having said all that, there is one myth here, and that is the other myth is that the sunscreen you use and is not proportional to your vitamin D absorption. The real reason people are vitamin D deficient is we don't spend enough time in the sun exposing enough body surface area. And A, because we're probably living in the wrong climates. And then in climates where they are living in the right climate, like in Asia, because of colonial and caste and various things, people don't want to go out 
in the sun because they'll tan easily and they don't want to look tanned. So there's this obsession with whitening, so they get deficient as well. So fundamentally, you know, the big part of the problem we see in gene testing is vitamin D deficiency genes. And I guess to a large degree, you can take a lesson from, um, you know, polar bears and Eskimos who basically ate a lot of salmon and cod. And so, for example, like I was telling you, when people went into Europe, their skin lightened to absorb vitamin D. But the Eskimos and Inuit, they're at the North Pole, but their skin is dark. How come? That's because their diet was so rich in salmon and cod. And salmon has, for example, and cod, they have about 1,000 international units of vitamin D per teaspoon. They're just so strong and power. They've got so potent vitamin D that the skin didn't need to lighten because it already had enough vitamin D. So that's why if you shave a polar bear, you know, their skin is black. The fur has got bleached white by the UV, but a polar bear's skin is black. So, you know, in the TED Talk, I'll tell you, I read a little story as to attract some attention for this theory. I said, I'm going to go to the Miss World purely for research. And I'm going to tell you that Miss Norway is going to have a better tan than Miss Estonia. And the reason for that is in Europe, Latvia, Lithuania, and Estonia, the three Baltic states. So when people came to those states, when they migrated to Europe, because the currents were warmer, they could farm grain. And if you could farm, grain has no vitamin D. So those skin lighten more than other people in the adjacent countries where they were eating salmon and seals and whales and things like that. So in actual fact, those are the three whitest countries in Europe. So, you know, a lot of our ancestry and skin color is shaped by diet as well as migration. So I always say, you know, the other way for looking at the genetics of health is like thinking about genes, germs and geography, you know, and that sort of explains. Yeah. That is fascinating. And I didn't understand any of that. But, you know, listening to you, I understand why people just kind of kind of coming back. I understand why the approach was just put on sunscreen no matter what, because I think people didn't realize that if your diet was in a certain way, you would become vitamin deficient. And I think on top of that, it, you know, many people won't do the work to calculate every day based on the different UV factor and everything like that. It is very comforting to know, though, you know, with the amount of salmon that I eat, that I'm probably getting enough vitamin D, even if I'm avoiding the sun too much. Absolutely. If you eat salmon, you know, you are a human polar bear, so you'll be fine. If you eat plenty of salmon, then you probably don't need to go out in the sun uh, because of the fact that you, from a vitamin D point of view, because of the fact that you will get plenty of vitamin D. Fascinating. Yeah. And, you know, it's also interesting. So that's actually the reason, one of the things early next year, I'm actually, because there was so much misconception that I'm actually releasing a range of sunscreens. And these are going to be actually have different ratings for different skin. So we have for type one, two and three skin, we'll have a different rating sunscreen than for darker skin type so that people can actually pick the one more tailored for their own skin type. Brilliant. And I thought that would be a way of also making the science more known because till now everyone's just trying to sell everything to everybody. And then if you brought this out, then people start thinking, why is it? And then in a way, it will also educate them as to what sun protection and SPF is all about. I love that. And, you know, my big takeaway here is use sunscreen, but use the right sunscreen in that we haven't been misled into thinking we need sunscreen because skin cancer is still very much a concern, but kind of like with diet that our one size fits all approach isn't correct. And you actually need to give a little bit of thought, at least know what your range is, what the range of the UV factor is in your hometown or wherever you're traveling, and then also give some consideration to your skin type, even if you don't do the calculation every time you go out. Absolutely. That's right. Once you have a general idea, it's actually pretty simple here. Love it. So I've realized now that we are coming up on time pretty soon. I want to get a chance to ask you a couple of our rapid fire questions that we always ask. The first one being, we love to assign homework to our audience. So I was wondering if we could give our audience a piece of homework on either of the topics that we covered today that they could actually do while they wait for next week's episode. I think the first thing would be to keep a food diary of everything that you ate during the week and look at how much of it is processed, how much of it is natural, just broadly without being too fussy about it. And also then broadly dividing them up into which ones are your omega 3s and vitamin Ds and which ones are, because it's actually quite interesting because what I find is often when people come with various health issues or skin issues, you ask them to do this, you straight away 
and they can rate themselves while they're doing this on each day, they rate themselves the next day as to how they felt that particular day on a sliding scale, be it from anything from pain to positivity and everything else. And actually what you'd be surprised is you'll find a trend as to which diets and which things actually make you feel better or work for you. Phenomenal. So I actually would love to ask, well, how do you recommend people do that? Because at, at one point, I know someone has recommended different apps. Some people recommend a spreadsheet. I think there probably is an intelligent way if, you know, if any app developer is out there and this hasn't been developed, there would be a really intelligent way to do a kind of regression analysis and say, look, foods that contain these ingredients make you feel crappy. But uh, in the meantime, is there a specific tool beyond just paper and pencil that you recommend? Yeah, no, at the, at the moment, it's just paper and pencil till you and I develop the app. Well, there you go. So if anyone out there wants to be our CTO... You know, That's right. We're, we're actively recruiting as of two seconds ago. That's right. Dr. Paul, I wanted to also ask you, are there any other kinds of skills, habits, or routines that you feel make you perform at a higher level? Yeah, I think, like I said earlier, it's the ability to look at things and learn creatively. And, you know, I know that you have an expertise and also interest in learning. And see, one day a week, I don't work in medicine, but I teach or with animals, but I teach creative writing to children in disadvantaged schools who can't read and write properly. And I've done this for many years and that ended up, because we know that it helps science and math, it ended up, I had a role on UNESCO as advisor for many years. One of the interesting things, for example, is if you, if I'm going to simplify creativity for you, and especially someone like you already knows accelerated learning, then I would say it's applying the three C's. And one is, you know, setting the context and which is, for someone like you, it may be like saying, defining your brand, I guess. And the second one would be developing the characters because in any story you write, you then develop the character, which means going into the problem and lastly, resolving conflict. So effectively, if you learn things with this approach, you come to a problem solving approach, which is good for both science and math and business and everything else. And you also learn more quickly. So what I found is like, you know, I've actually invented two new surgical operations. And what I found is they weren't actually minor improvements on previous ones, but they were quite different. But that's largely because the way we're taught knowledge is we learn something as a series of facts, and then we try and living within that world, we try and advance it. But if you're completely creative, then with this problem solving approach, you actually find that you're looking at the problem and you're saying, okay, what's the context here? What are we trying to do? What is the character? Understand each one. Same thing like we're talking about diets, whatever. So I think with this approach, you also get to the bottom of the problem very quickly. So I'm an advisor for many different, you know, scientific groups. Somebody was asking me the other day to look, look at, you know, manuka honey in New Zealand, how it impacts those various things. And what I think is it makes me very productive. So my publishers, for example, Simon & Schuster, they said nobody in history has ever written fiction, nonfiction, poetry, and medical books. And I've got three novels three nonfiction books, a poetry volume, and three medical books. And the thing is, and I think, so people think, wow, that's, you know, amazing. But actually, you don't stop to think about it. It just happens because you get curious about a problem, and then you start learning in a creative way, and it just opens new doors, and then you get interested in something else. You're constantly moving. Fascinating. I like that. And it's a little bit like what we teach in our course, which we call kind of brute force learning, that people who learn from many diverse sources and don't channel themselves into one subject or one medium of learning, find an acceleration in all of their learning because of this ability of the human brain and really no other supercomputer that we know of to synthesize huge amounts of information and then apply it in various different avenues that might seem disconnected. That's right. I love it. So I know we're, we're running up on time here. I did want to ask you if there are any kind of products or services that are very critical to your day-to-day -day life that you couldn't work without or live without. I think it's really only, unfortunately, because of the nature of my work, you have to always be connected. So I mean, somebody needs to be able to access me and it's both necessary evil. And I think, you know, without Wi-Fi or a connection, you think, oh my God, because I travel a lot and I deal with a lot of complicated patients, things who travel from many countries to see me. So what it means is that staff always need to be able to access me. So I often find the thing I can't live without is without being 
connected somehow, which is not a good thing. But unfortunately, it's to answer your question, that's the truth of the matter. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. What are you using for your team to be able to contact you? Well, uh, pretty much, you know, it's just really when I'm traveling, it's really just, you know, either just your iPhone or iPad and that kind of stuff. But what it means is wherever you go, you're trying to find some Wi-Fi, some network, some way right. where people can always be in touch with you. But we've linked everything up. So, for example, when I see skin cancers, we use um, demoscopy where we can, it's like, you know, polarized light and things where you can have different patterns for different kind of skin lesions, which may uh, give you a diagnosis. And so what I find is because we've trained other stuff to be able to take those images. So sometimes I'll be traveling somewhere else and they can send you an image and you can give them a spot diagnosis. So we use it for telemedicine, various things. Mm -hmm. So yeah, we, we know that at least you can keep working and you can also you can actually still advise people even if you're not physically there. Incredible. So Dr. Paul, I want to wrap us up with the kind of second to last question, which is where can people get a hold of you and learn a little bit more, maybe get in contact if they want to see you speak or take advantage of some of the services and products you offer? Yeah, the simplest one is to go to my website. It's just um, sharadpaul.com. That's S-H-A-R-A-D-P-A-U-L.com. And you can see all the, you know, the books and also other products which are coming up and you can get the gene test done if you're interested. There is a get in touch thing there. You can also email me. It's basically just sharad at sharadpaul.com. And yeah, I'm pretty easy to get hold of really. Incredible. And you weren't kidding. I'm looking at your website right now and there are so many different diverse books, The Natural Man, The Kite Flyers, To Kill a Dragonfly, it looks like, Snow That's Dragonfly. Right. Wow, incredible. So I encourage people to check it out. And, and I think next time we speak, we have to do a conversation about creativity and productivity. <laughs> That's right. Awesome. So I want to thank you very, very much for coming on the show. Before I do that, though, I wanted to ask you if people are able to take away, because we covered so many different diverse topics, if people take away really one big message from this interview and they carry it with them for the rest of their lives, what would you hope for that to be? It's really the, you know, the three simplest things for life is, you know, eat simply, move well, and give more, I think is the three things which are for, is a message for health and everything else. So, you know, the more time you give to people, then you find you actually have more time. I mean, you eat in moderation, then you find that you can actually eat many varied things. And then if you move, you know, the movement is so important. For example, the single best form of exercise, reduced dementia, for example, is dancing the tango as opposed to mm -hmm. yoga or tai chi because it's movement. And the movement for movement's sake is the most important. So it's less choreographed and more for movement's sake. So it can be anything, but you know, movement is very important, which is why martial arts obviously they help because they're like a form of dance and yeah, so. Fantastic. So Dr. Paul, I really, again, want to thank you. I really enjoyed this conversation. We covered so much more than I expected we would. So I really appreciate it. And I look forward to us having you back on the show again. Oh, it's a real pleasure. We should test your genes and then we can talk about it on another show. I would love to do that. So I will <laughs> set a reminder here in my own kind of productivity tool that we should uh, contact you and have you back on the show. And we can do that. Thank you. All right. My friend, you take care. And go well. You take care. All right, super friends, that is all we have for you today, but I hope you guys really enjoyed the show and I hope you learned a ton of actionable information, tips, advice that will help you go out there and overcome the impossible. If you've enjoyed the show, please take a moment to leave us a review on iTunes or Stitcher or drop us a quick little note on the Twitter machine at Go Superhuman. Also, if you have any ideas for anyone out there who you would love to see on the show, we always love to hear your recommendations. You can submit on our website or you can just drop us an email and let us know. That's all for today, guys. Thanks for tuning in. Thanks for tuning in to the Becoming Superhuman podcast. For more great skills and strategies or for links to any of the resources mentioned in this episode, visit www.becomingasuperhuman.com slash podcast. We'll see you next time.